I want to start us off today with a case study. And the case study that we will be covering to begin class today is SeaWorld. Okay, and I think most of us have been to SeaWorld at some point, is that correct? Is it the San Antonio Park? Yes, yes. I went to the San Diego Park. Bessie, you, you've you been? Okay. Um, SeaWorld opened its first marine zoological park in 1964. So it's kind of a, a Disneyland, Disney World knockoff, but with a marine emphasis. Okay, they have three US locations, San Diego, San Antonio, and Orlando. San Antonio is kind of the theme park capital of Texas. We actually don't have a major theme park here in Houston, so all the Houston people go over to San Antonio and they want to have a theme park experience. We have Kima, but, I mean, it's Kima. <laughs> we used to have Astro World, but that shut down. The biggest attraction over the years has been the Shamu performance. Okay, Shamu uh, is an orca-based performance where the trainers do circus-like acts with the orcas. The orcas will leap out of the water, they'll splash the audience, they'll dive deep, they'll, um, they'll allow the trainers to ride on them. Okay, and SeaWorld's most memorable attractions have always been the spectacular performances of the orcas. They have supplemented their orca performances, though, with other shows, including beluga whale dances and even instrument playing otters. Okay. Um, they've had a lot of success over the decades. Okay, by 2009, SeaWorld was valued at uh, $2.5 billion with over a billion dollars in income annually and roughly 6.5 million visitors per year. They expanded from the animals themselves into coasters and other more mainstream kinds of theme park elements. Okay, but the main attraction at SeaWorld has always been the animals themselves and the marine zoological emphasis that's their niche product. Okay, SeaWorld ran into trouble in 2010 when this trainer, Don Branchot, was fatally injured in February of that year. Okay, she was attacked by a 12,000 pound whale named Pilicum. SeaWorld executives initially blamed the incident on the trainer, but it quickly became evident that it was no, not due to trainer error. She was an expert trainer, and all who were present at the incident testified that she had been doing precisely what she's supposed to be doing. It was a really tragic incident. She was dragged to the bottom, and Tilikum basically sat on her. Uh, it's, a, it's a very sad uh, incident, but upon further investigation, actually, Tilikum, the whale, had had previous incidents. In fact, a history of aggression. And more investigations were done, and it was soon determined that the likely cause of these aggressive incidents that Tilikum had had were his living conditions. Okay, so if you look at this graphic, this overhead picture, there's the performance pool out front, but the actual living pool where Tilikum lived is the one in the red circle right there. Now, it doesn't take much insight to see that that's really small for an animal of this size. In the wild, orcas will range hundreds or even thousands of miles, but in captivity, Tilikum had a hundred by hundred feet or thereabouts most of the time. And Tilikum appeared upon close inspection to be acting out in response to some of the difficulties of his living conditions. Now let's think about this for just a minute from the perspective of SeaWorld executives. It's not too difficult to see why Tilikum's living conditions are like this. What is the reasoning when SeaWorld executives make their decision about how to, how much 
to give the animals in terms of living conditions. What is the reasoning there? Why do they give Tilikum this tiny little thing? They're trying to save as much money as possible. Okay, it's real straightforward. This is a cost-benefit decision that SeaWorld made, and they decided that it made more sense for them financially to give the animals as little as possible. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration got involved. OSHA or OSHA is an employee protection agency. Okay, and when you get into business or run your own business or, or work as an executive in another business, you'll find pretty quickly that they have some pretty strict rules. And it's good that they have these rules. Sometimes they're a bit onerous, but they do a good job of protecting employees with these strict rules. Asha argued that SeaWorld put its employees at great risks when putting them in the pool. After the attack on Dawn, SeaWorld had already implemented new safety procedures to try to ward off lawsuits from Asha, but Asha pushed for rules regarding the proximity of the orcas and the trainers. In particular, they attempted to shut down the circus-like performances. The media got involved, and a bunch of ordinary folks got involved too. Feeling ran very high, and it got to the point where People holding signs would stand by the dozens or even hundreds in front of SeaWorld parks. And to get into the park, you had to run a gamut with people on both sides of you holding signs saying things like captivity kills. Okay, so obviously media interest and popular interest were very high. SeaWorld fought back with its own marketing campaign. Like this one right here, SeaWorld recognizes the important bond between mother and calf. I should say, as part of the investigation, it was uncovered that SeaWorld regularly separated mothers and calves from each other as soon as the calf was born, so as to better tame the calf and to prevent some sort of a relational connection that could undermine SeaWorld, undermine the docile, docility of the animals and prevent SeaWorld from completely controlling the animals' um, interactions. So they would separate the mothers and the calves and put the calves on the other side of the park and the mothers would call for them at night and things like that. Okay, but SeaWorld uh, fought back with their own marketing campaign about how they were environmentally sensitive. In the middle of this very charged atmosphere, a movie was released, uh, Blackfish, which maybe some of us have seen. Has anyone seen this? No one has heard of it but hasn't seen it, okay. This documentary was released in 2013 and it shed light on the effects of orca captivity and highlighted SeaWorld's unethical practices toward their employees in the community. This documentary gave SeaWorld a world of trouble. And here's the stock price after Blackfish premieres. So, imagine yourself as a SeaWorld executive and suppose that you have built a business in a niche area of the theme park industry centered on marine emphases. The marine focus of your business has been very successful over the years. And now there's this media frenzy. A documentary about your business practices has been released. And it's probable that you're not going to be able to continue doing what you've been doing. In fact, it's almost certain you're not going to be able to continue doing that. What do you do at that point? What do you do? Here are several options, and maybe I could just throw these out there and uh, ask if anybody has an opinion. Um, you suspend the circus-like performances, okay, and instead offer the public some sort of a learning experience where maybe they can't get close to the animals and maybe the trainers can't get close to the animals but maybe they can sort of see the animals from a distance and be instructed or educated about the animals in that regard. Okay, you could concentrate on other kinds of things like the roller coasters, more general mainstream theme park elements. Okay, or, and I'm not joking here, you could shut down, wind the business model down because everything that the business model had been built around was uh, up to that point the circus-like performances with the orcas which is the main draw that people brought people to the theme parks what would you do in this sort of a situation what can an executive do 
pretty difficult, isn't it? Nick? Rebrand it? What would what might that look like just off the top of your head? I'm just asking for general ideas. I guess you would still uh, if we're going with the central theme, we would still be using the different plugins and plugins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. That might require some capital outlay, but I think that that sort of thing would be promising. Good. Um, what they, in fact, did, they decided to end the circus-like performances. They were under heavy public pressure and really didn't have a choice about that. They also decided to end their breeding programs. That was the second step. The public scrutiny focused especially on their mistreatment of the orcas in the breeding programs. Okay, but they couldn't just release the orcas into the wild because once in captivity, the orcas lose the ability to navigate the wild like they could have previously, including hunting or uh, dealing with um, potential threats. So they started up a new orca experience show which basically just involved people at a distance seeing the orcas swim normally. As part of that, they had to give the orcas much better living conditions. But they're no longer capturing orcas like they used to in the wild. They used to have hunting parties, uh, cap cap captivity parties, I guess you could call them, where um, the, the ships would uh, cut off orcas from the group and uh, capture them. But they don't do that anymore. Okay, and SeaWorld is attempting to rebuild their business model. They were doing relatively well at this, okay, uh, trying to still stay with that marine niche that they had until this year with the collapse of all theme parks. And at this point, uh, their business model is in complete chaos. So I'm not sure what they're going to do going forward. Uh, all theme parks are in complete chaos right now. Uh, uh, their attendance has collapsed, uh, and it's really difficult. It's probably the darkest days of the theme park industry in maybe its entire history. Any questions about the SeaWorld case? All right. What we see in this case is a structure for decision-making and thinking that has repeated itself time and time again, and that when you look at business and the environment, topics at the juncture of business and the environment, you see repeatedly. Okay, Bessie, please grab the lights for us. Um, that structure is one in which it is in the business interests of business to do harm to the environment. And I'm going to generalize, and I'm going to say in the great majority of cases, it is in the financial interests of business to do harm to the environment. That's why it's so hard to actually motivate business in a constructive way to do right by the environment. Let me give you guys some examples here. Okay, so... Um, If you think about our own city of Houston and the companies that dominate our city, it's pretty clear that it's the energy industry that's dominant here. And I'm just going to use it as kind of a poster boy for this. The energy industry almost always makes more money at any level of the energy industry, upstream, midstream, and downstream, by harming the environment. Okay, if that means... Um, dumping wastes, or if that means flaring uh, natural gas, whatever, it's almost always more cost effective for companies in the in in energy industry to not show genuine concern for the environment. 
But actually, surprisingly enough, it's also almost always more cost effective for other kinds of companies in the energy industry that might be have the reputation of being clean companies to do the same. For instance, let's take one company as an example here. Okay, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation here, but I'll just talk you through the structure. Everybody's familiar with Tesla. It's a real widespread name these days. Tesla has carved out a niche with the reputation for being an environmentally conscious company. Tesla is actually, when you look at it more closely, a company that presents the appearance of being environmentally conscious. They're not really environmentally conscious. For instance, here are two examples of that. Teslas run off the grid. Okay, they run on coal power, natural gas power, and any other power components that make up the grid. Okay, they're not internal combustion engine products. When you actually look at the environmental footprint of a Tesla and compare it to the environmental footprint of an ICE-based car that's driving alongside it on the highway, the Tesla actually has a larger environmental footprint. So it's actually worse for the environment because of the composition of the grid. Now, the case can be made without a doubt that we can change the composition of the grid. And over time, I'm sure that that's what we will do. But at the present time and for the foreseeable future, Teslas are actually dirtier than other mainstream cars. Teslas are also dirtier because they, uh, because of the rare earth elements in their batteries, which can't be uh, recycled when they get discarded. There's also um, a, an impact from that. On the basis of cases like this, a question arises, and that question is what to do about um, environmental motivation. If it is so much against the interests of business to do right by the environment that even the companies that have a reputation for doing right by the environment like Tesla are really only presenting the appearance of doing right by the environment then how can we navigate this situation how can we actually make it going forwards the case that business has a better relationship with the environment, uh, better than it has been. As a way of answering this question, I want us to look at the Beyond Integrity text. Let's open up the Hoffman article and get started with answering this question. By the way, you guys can make comments or ask questions at any point along the way. I'm looking on page 394 here. Actually, 395, bottom of the first column. Hoffman wants to clarify the following thoughts in the course of this article. The debate must clarify such fundamental questions as, one, what obligation does business have to help with our environmental crisis? Two, what is the proper relationship between business and government, especially when faced with a social problem of the magnitude of the environmental crisis? And three, what rationale should be used for making and justifying decisions to protect the environment. Okay, so those are the questions that Hoffman will answer in the course of the article. Hoffman starts with this quote from uh, the thinker Norman Bowie, and I'm going to read the quotes. It's not a long one. And then I want us to think about it and its implications. Here's the quote. This is not Hoffman directly. This is Hoffman quoting Norman Bowie. Business does not have an obligation to protect the environment over and above what is required by law. However, it does have a moral obligation to avoid intervening in the political arena in order to defeat or weaken environmental legislation. Okay, that's a very interesting quote. It's got two parts to it. One is business does not do, need to do anything to preserve and protect the environment beyond what the law itself requires. Okay, and the second part of it is Business should not try to defeat or weaken environmental legislation in the political process. Let me put up here a 
couple of options in response to what to do about environmental motivation and just in general trying to motivate business to do right by the environment. On, on the topic of business and the environment, everybody agrees in theory that it's good for business to do right by the environment, but in practice, everyone fails and doesn't do it. Okay, like we talked about before, the reason why is because it is not in the immediate self-interest of each individual business to do right by the environment. Although everyone agrees in theory that it is in the collective self-interest, just not in each individual self-interest. Okay, one approach is, our, is articulated in this quote by Bowie, and we can trace it back to Milton Friedman. If you remember at the beginning of the semester, when I was talking about the purpose of business, Friedman said, look, the purpose of business is to do what the capital providers, the owners, desire. And most of the time, what the owners desire is money making. So the purpose of business is to make money. Okay, now on Friedman's view, you should always only make money within the rules of the game. That's an important component of Friedman's view. You don't step outside of the rules of the game. You don't violate or cheat against, over and against the rules of the game. And Bowie's quotation that Hoffman is citing here is very Friedman-esque. Because Bowie is saying, look, you need to abide by the rules of the game, but don't go above and beyond the rules of the game. You're not required to do that. Okay, what you are required to do as a business is to abide by the rules of the game. And I think that there's a lot going for this approach as a response to the question. Okay, because on this approach, the Friedman approach, the way you preserve and protect the environment is by passing legislation that preserves and protects the environment and requires businesses to run their business in a manner that preserves and protects the environment. You do not preserve and protect the environment by means of some sort of external cultural pressure beyond what the law requires. Businesses don't have to do more than what the law says on the Friedman, uh, Friedman view. Their responsibility is to make as much money as they can within the bounds of the law in accordance with the rules of the game. Okay, and so if you want to preserve and protect the environment on the Friedman view, that's fine, that's cool, let's do it. But let's do it by passing legislation that requires businesses to preserve and protect the environment in the ways that we want. Okay, expecting them to go in above and beyond what the law says is requiring them to do something different than what their mission ought to be. Okay, on this approach. All right, there's a second approach I want to look at, but let me pause. I've talked for a little bit. Let me pause and ask if there are questions or comments about companies that present the appearance of being environmentally conscious or about the question of how to motivate companies actually to be environmentally conscious or about the Friedman-esque response, which is that uh, companies should be motivated by what the law requires and by nothing more because that's not their responsibility. Questions or comments so far? Yeah, Nick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think that that's right. It strikes me that the intuitively most straightforward way to in motivate businesses to be environmentally friendly, at least on this approach, is to tax them heavily if they're not, um, to fine them, uh, maybe, maybe tariffs uh, for goods that are coming in from overseas. You can make it in the interests of business with the right kind of an incentive structure is the thinking here. Okay, and this is something we've talked about before. That's a great comment, Nick. So um, society wants one thing and the individual wants another. Society wants us to go in that direction, the individual or the individual business is motivated by virtue of the costs to go in the other direction into the money-making enterprise of business. The way to motivate the individual 
to want what society wants is to make it prohibitively expensive for the individual or the individual business to try to do something that is contrary to what the society wants. So on a Friedman-esque view, um, look, we don't need to be demanding of our corporate leaders that they be good citizens who go above and beyond what the law requires. Rather, if we want to make business environmentally friendly, what we need to do is pass laws that compel them, coerce them through cost structures to be environmentally friendly instead of expecting some sort of behavioral change. Okay, um, other questions or comments before I talk a little more about that? Very good so far? Okay. Um, there's a second view, and it's the view that Hoffman wants to provide us with. I'll just call it the Hoffman approach. Did I spell approach correctly? I think I did. Sometimes it's hard to spell when you're so close to the board. Okay. Um, Hoffman writes on 396. Second column. If the business ethics, this is toward the bottom of the column. If the business ethics movement has led us anywhere in the past 15 years, it is to the position that business has an ethical responsibility to become a more active partner in dealing with social concerns. A little further down, corporations have special knowledge, expertise, and resources which are invaluable in dealing with the environmental crisis. Society needs the ethical vision and cooperation of all its players to solve its most urgent problems, especially ones that involve the very survival of the planet itself. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, Hoffman is saying, look, the problem with the Friedman view is that it is not asking business to step up and go above and beyond the minimum and do potentially what it could do with the expertise and special knowledge and leadership that it has. Some of our business persons, our business persons, some of them are the brightest and best that we have. And what we need to do is actually ask them to step up to the plate and to manifest that in their behaviors. Okay, and Hoffman writes later on 397, first column, he says, there are examples of corporations demonstrating such leadership, even when this has been a risk to their self-interest. In the area of environmental moral leadership, one might cite DuPont's discontinuing its Freon products, a $750 million a year business, because of their possible negative effects on the ozone layer and Procter & Gamble's manufacture of concentrated fabric softener and detergents, which require less packaging. Okay, so there certainly are examples of businesses that have taken financial hits in order to do right by the environment. At least Hoffman, Hoffman thinks that these are, are examples of that. Okay, um, a distinction I've made earlier in the semester might be useful here. Some actions in life are obligatory. We have to do them in order to fulfill the basic constituents of good human responsibility. Other actions in life are supererogatory. Supererogatory actions are actions that we don't have to do, but we, most of us ought to do. Okay, um, an obligatory action is an action that you must do. If someone is drowning and it would be minimally costly for you to rescue that person, no risk to life and limb to yourself, you must do it. If you don't do it, you don't even fulfill the basic threshold of human decency. But a supererogatory action is one that it would be a good idea for you to do, but you don't have to do. A good formula to think about when thinking of supererogatory actions is all may do it, none must do it, most should do it. 
all may, none must, most should. And Hoffman seems to be suggesting that doing right by the environment has a supererogatory character. All may, none must, most should. Okay, and it's the sort of thing that businesses ought to do if they have the financial means to do it. Okay, um, and Hoffman spends the balance of the article talking about how to motivate business to actually genuinely care for the environment. And let me uh, highlight a couple of things that he says there before, um, before I take a break and make a couple other comments. Okay, um, he says, I'm just going to read bits and pieces on 398 and 399. I'm not opposed to these efforts. In most cases, I think they should be encouraged. There is certainly nothing wrong with making money while protecting the environment, just as there's nothing wrong with feeling good about doing one's duty. Okay, but if business is adopting or being encouraged to adopt the view that good environmentalism is good business, then I think this poses a danger for the environmental ethics movement. In other words, Hoffman is saying that the way to motivate business to actually genuinely care for the environment is not to say that doing right by the environment is good for business, because for most businesses it's not. Okay, um, on, on the second column on the same page, he says, is the rationale that good ethics is good business a proper one for business ethics? I think not. Okay, one thing that the study of ethics has taught us over the past 2,500 years is that being ethical may on occasion require that we place the interests of others ahead of or at least on par with our own interests. Okay, so the way to motivate business to do right by the environment is not to try to spin a story or make the claim that it is in the financial well-being of business to do right by the environment, because it almost always is not. Yes, there are a few businesses that can make money by virtue of environmentally friendly policies. In a minute, we're going to look at Patagonia, which is an example of a business of that kind. Okay, but I, the other day, got a burrito from Chipotle. Chipotle is a company that locally sources its food. They do this because it's a shtick with millennials. They might also do it out of genuine concern, but they might do it actually for marketing reasons. I'm not sure. Okay, Chipotle locally sources its food to save on transportation costs, help with the environment that way. If there's one issue that unites millennials that millennials care about, it's environmental concern. And Chipotle knows this. And so I think part of the reason why they do this is so as to make a better business for themselves. There are a few companies like Chipotle where good business means doing right by the environment. But for most businesses, this is not the case. Okay, for most businesses, um, Presenting the appearance of doing right by the environment while in fact doing the opposite is a much better business decision than genuinely doing right by the environment. Okay, let me stop and ask if there are comments or reflections on it on this. Yeah, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess one thing that I've always struggled with in understanding the Friedman approach is I don't see how you can create genuine concern for the environment if everybody's always only doing the minimal amount required. Um, it's something that I guess I, I just don't understand. And, and the, the approach seems to think that the way to bring about environmental change is through coercion and people fulfilling the minimum amount that the coercion expects of them. And I guess I, I just have always struggled with seeing how that can bring about real change. Yeah. Other comments? So I'm with you. I actually don't think that that's the best approach. I think that Hoffman's is better. But to be perfectly frank, there aren't any very good solutions in this space. Uh, it is so much in the interests of business to present the appearance of caring for the environment while not actually doing so. 
that the incentive to, I mean, to, to surreptitiously, secretly cheat on pollution emissions or on whatever the topic is, uh, it, I mean, it's just overwhelming. The, the incentive to do that is just overwhelming. Okay. All right, let's take a quick break. And then we'll come back.